On, I'd like to call the to order the New York City Transit Committee meeting. Uh, let's get started with the public safety announcements. Your safety is of foremost importance to the MTA. Therefore, we ask that you listen to the following instructions. In the event of an emergency, notify emergency personnel in the room and 911 should be called. If an alarm sounds, wait for a public address announcement and follow instructions. If told to go to another floor or to evacuate the building, leave all unessential items behind and use stairwell A just across the main hallway or stairwell D down the hallway past the elevators. An automated external defibrillator, AED, for use by trained personnel is in the main hallway just past the elevators. Thank you and have a safe day. Thank you. Uh, let's move on to our public speakers. Good morning and welcome to this month's MTA New York City Transit Committee meeting. We have 22 members of the public registered to speak today. We ask that all speakers adhere to the MTA's rules of conduct and decorum. As a reminder to the public speakers that in the interest of time and fairness to all speakers, we limit everyone to two minutes. Please be aware that there will be a warning beep to remind you that you have 30 seconds to conclude your remarks. The first speaker will be Kara Girl, followed by Murray Bowden. Good morning. I'm Kara Girl, Research and Communications Associate at the Permanent Citizens Advisory Committee to the MTA, PCAC. Month after month, the trend continues. Weekends are consistently regaining their pre-pandemic levels faster than weekdays. And with the holiday season upon us, we only expect weekend trains to be even more packed with riders in the coming weeks. We've spoken at past committee and board meetings about the need for better weekend service and have since met and visited stations with the new weekend service star, Jose LaSalle, including, the flag, at, changing the flag. including at our November Transit Riders Council meeting and in a subsequent ride along. He's made it clear that his team is hard at work improving service and bettering the often complicated rider experience on weekends and has been very responsive to issues we've raised. We're hopeful that headways and reliability will continue to improve while still allowing for critical repair work to get done. As he pointed out, service isn't the only priority for weekend riders. It's important that signage, redundancy, and communication are sufficient too. In the span of just a few months, we've already noticed some improvements. Clearer signs about shuttle bus locations, a, new, a useful new weekender newsletter, helpful transit workers on platforms, and better service updates and stations, to name a few. It would be great to implement some of these low-hanging fruit improvements to better communicate with riders all days of the week. Bus service is another top priority for riders around the city, and we're excited to learn more about the Brooklyn bus redesign next month. We're hopeful, to learn, we're hopeful that the lessons learned and the tools used to make the Bronx bus redesign so successful will be applied in this and future redesigns. The key performance metrics and rider sur survey results visualized in the new committee books point to more areas for improvement, including subway delays caused by infrastructure and equipment that we hope can be solved with more investment in the capital program. We're glad that these metrics are broken down for the public and advocates to see, and thank you for working towards better transparency. We share the common goal of improving service and the overall transit experience for riders, and know that with investment and innovation, we can get there. Thank you. Thank you for your remarks. Our next speaker will be Murray Bowden, followed by Charlton D'Souza over Zoom. The biggest issue facing us today is called global warming. That means we have to use resources in a better way than we ever did before. I follow the way uh, and bus systems are taken care of here, and I came across the fact that they're developing, well, in my car when I get a flat tire, it tells me, sends me an email, something wrong with the car. Buses are developing a system. Pretext is called, I read it. It's a system that monitors the functions of the bus itself and tells you when it needs service. That's incredible. You fix the bus before it breaks down. That's saving resources. Now, I never heard of that before until I, I get news feeds from a lot of places and that came up on it. One of the things. And so you all should know that the team you have leading transit 
is looking for the most innovative ways to extend the life of the equipment that you have, use less resources, and when you have a bus that was repaired before it broke down, you saved all kinds of traffic. People have a bus that doesn't break down. That's incredible. So the team that's leading, you know, I stood here a lot of times and I complained this morning. When you're doing something right, my job is to tell you, your team is looking for ways to be innovative. And thank you very much for finding these people who are bringing innovation to the uh, transit. I wear this jacket because I walk around and I don't want to get hit. And I have a cane with reflective on there because of safety things. And I've said it, I thank you all for being here. And you know, I want to thank these people because they did a good job. And I hear you beeping, but I'm going home. Thank you for your remarks. Our next speaker will be Charlton D'Souza, followed by Jason Anthony. Good after, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Charlton D'Souza, president of Passengers United. And I am so outraged because last month, the MTE chairman said crime is a perception. And you have to realize that we've had two or three hate crimes in the subway already. We've had several slashings and stabbings. Um, so the subways are not safe. The subways are still in a state of emergency. And that's because there's not enough police that can fill the four hour tours of overtime assignments that have been given to the precincts. So, you know, that needs to be addressed. Also the mental health situation in the subways. I have yet to see the head of homeless outreach come to an empty border committee meeting to talk about what's being done to help the mentally ill in the subway. That's what we need to start focusing on now, mental illness in the subway. We have people shooting drugs, needles in the subway. We have people sleeping under benches. That is dangerous and unacceptable. And our elected officials keep saying it's safe for people to be in the subways. No, it's not, um, you know, because they could get attacked too. They could be victims and of crime. So we have to protect the homeless as well in the subways and they shouldn't even be there. I also wanna talk about something you're gonna hear a lot about today, six minute service. Six minute service can only be done on CBTC lines. However, it is not, it is unrealistic because number one, we don't even have the train crews to do this service. And half the train crews are getting sick. Many train crews are being assaulted in the subway system. So the pipe dream of six minute service is gonna take us maybe 10 to 15 years to get. And we also have a looming budget shortfall with New York City Transit, where there's gonna be budget cuts, there's gonna be fare increases. So we have to crack down on fare beating, fare evasion, but we also need to do other things, which we're gonna mention. So thank you. Thank you for your remarks. Our next speaker is Jason Anthony. Uh, good morning, Francis. Thanks, Nancy. Live from Amazon Skiffa Warehouse. Uh, Charlton, the first I forget a point that you're truly coming to Amazon at 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning and doesn't see police presence at those times in the morning. And the other day, while I was coming to work, I saw a person on the R train towards Brooklyn spraying on an unoccupied object to the brakes on inside the R train towards Brooklyn. What's going on? He could do taka taka taka, but where is he when we need him? But I want to thank uh, the president of the city transit, which Davy. Uh, Inviting me to the uh, to subway day this past month, but uh, we need more police presence, especially during the overnight, because I come in to my work at three and four o'clock in the morning, and I don't see no police presence in my home station, not even at Whitehall Street South Ferry. We could see them during the day, but not during the overnight hours. And recently, I 
not even see the homeless outreach first people at Whitehall Street South Ferry. And where is the police commissioner that we haven't seen her at the MTA board meetings? Where is she? We need her to appear at the MTA board. I'll see you guys next month in person. Thank you for your remarks. Our next speakers will be Jean Ryan, followed by Christopher Greif. Hi. I'm Jean Ryan. I'm president of Disabled in Action of Metropolitan New York, DIA for short. My testimony today is two things. I want to say again about the evacuation notice uh, in case of an emergency. Am I supposed to use stairwell A or B? Because you don't mention wheelchair users. What are we supposed to do in case of an emergency? I know I'm not taking either one of those stairwells. Uh, and I would appreciate it if you would think about it and make a different announcement because we all have to be included in an emergency, not forgotten. Thank you. Now, my other testimony is about the LEAP Passenger app, L-E-A-P. And it's for on-demand e-hail passengers, the uh, users, the 1,200 people who are in the pilot with Accessoride so we could get a uh, same-day transportation. It was introduced uh, to us on October 18, 2021, over a year ago. And it's unusable unless, from that time to now, unless we give permissions of accessing our contacts, our location, photos, and media, and manage phone calls. Why all these permissions? I get that some of them are necessary to use an app, but not our contacts. And I have sent, I sent an, uh, Mr. Alfred of LEAP, gave a presentation to uh, the Accessoride Advisory Committee on over November 10th, 2021. I complained on December 13th to Don Ramonde and Quimel Arroyo. I got no, no, no change. I sent an email to Don on April 15, 2022, no change. We had, we had a meeting in May. We discussed it on, uh, with our advisory committee. And then November 17th, I sent an email. We're, it's still the same app that's requiring too many permissions. Please do something about it. Thank you. Thank you for your remarks. Our next speaker will be Christopher Greif, followed by Emily Rose Pratz. Good morning. I am Christopher D. Greif. As an advocate for all accessibilities, and one thing I want to say to the NYPD, thank you, Chief, because your NYPD have been on the train stations. They have been on the train, including the holiday train. And it's great to see the holiday train running again because the kids are happy. They're happy. Your, your, your officers are there. They feel safe. They feel happy. And I also like to remind that NYPD have been at the stations, but we also remember we do have undercover cops. We have MTA police. They could be anywhere. A respond to something could be anywhere along the platforms. They're there. I've seen them in all the boroughs, and yes, in Queens as well. I do travel on every train, every bus, including accessible stations. It is not easy for the NYPD or the MTA police because they cannot be there everywhere. But at the same time, we have something. As the slogan will say, if you see something, say something. How we're supposed to work together with the NYPD, MTA police, and the community if we're putting everything down. We have to work together. We're in a holiday season. We should be enjoying the holiday spirit and working as a team. That's why there are community council meetings at the regular local precincts, as well as the PSAs. They should be attending those meetings. There are also ways of working with the transit officers and, and with the chiefs of both divisions to make sure that we have proper safety on buses, 
trains, and yes, an accessorider as well, because we have to work together. And again, I want to say thank you. And for everyone, wish you a happy, healthy holiday. And let's keep the holiday train running as a normal one train for the Sundays, because the kids are loving it. Nice and colorful trains. So let's give a good, happy moment. And I hope to see you guys there, too, on the train so we can all have fun taking pictures. Happy holidays, everyone. Thank you for your remarks. Our next speaker will be Emily Rose Prats, followed by Andy Pollack. Good morning. Thank you for hearing my testimony today. Uh, my name is Emily Rose Prats. This is my 16th year here in New York City. I lived in Crown Heights, in Flatbush, in Ridgewood, um, and I want to talk about why investing in six-minute service is really crucial to me and to others across the city. So I'm testifying today actually as a bike commuter. Why am I here? Um, because it's really subway unreliability and inaccessibility that's driven me away after 13 years of subway ridership. Um, so for most of my 13 years commuting by subway, I had multiple jobs to try and make ends meet. My hours were often outside traditional nine to five. So I'd get off at 2 a.m. I'd have a 27 minute wait on a deserted subway platform at Canal Street. I'd be jockeying for a spot on an L train shuttle bus at 7.30 on a Saturday morning. So even then, and especially now um, that the pandemic has really upended how we live, how we work, prioritizing reliable transit only during traditional rush hours is really out of touch with rider needs. And on an individual note, I've developed spinal and joint degeneration over time. And those mean that I cannot, I can't stand on a platform for 17 minutes waiting for a train and then stand on the train for 20 minutes without being in extreme pain. So more frequent service for me would mean a less painful experience overall, as well as less crowded platforms and cars, and that would make seating more accessible. This more equitable access to transit would mean more subway trips for me and elevated ridership for the MTA. If the city expects workers like me to keep it running 24 seven, then the city owes us reliable, accessible transit 24 seven and six minute service would be a big step in the right direction. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your remarks. Our next speaker will be Andy Pollack, followed by Michael Ring. Good morning, Richard. Good morning, Hada, and good morning, everyone. So two things I'm gonna bring up this month. Number one, I'm sure as you all know, and everybody knows this, that I am a Fresh Meadows Queens resident. And recently, my New York State Assemblywoman, Nilly Rosick, has brought to my attention about the Q73 bus route that would go along 73rd Avenue. This route is infeasible because during rush hour from 182nd Street to 188th Street, the traffic light over at 185th Street, especially at 188th Street, causes too much gridlock. And just this year, there have been three accidents at the intersection of 73rd Avenue and 184th Street. Two incidents back in April were a hit and run. The first one back on April 1st, I had to call 911 to report it. And I got home from work yesterday. And guess what? A Honda rear-ended a Toyota. Just so that way, the driver of the Honda can make up time using the stop signs on 184th Street. So this route is clearly not going to work. We need to go back to the drawing board. And honestly, somebody probably just came up with this route with a computer and not physically being at the location. And the next point I want to make up, six-minute service. It's not feasible right now. We have a staffing shortage. It's not going to work. McKenzie and company has projected that the MTA will not have full staffing until the year 2025. All right, you can look this up. McKenzie and company did their own research. So whoever's coming up with the six-minute idea it's not going to be feasible for at least another three to four years. So that's all I'm going to say for now. Thank you all very much. And I expect to speak again in December. Thank you for your remarks. Our next speaker will be Michael Ring, followed by Betsy Plum. Hi, uh, I'm Michael Ring. Uh, for those that need it, uh, a visual description. I'm a middle-aged white guy wearing a blue hat and a hoodie that says Disabled in Action, the organization I'm representing today. Um, I, I'm, I'm lucky enough to be an Accessoride user, um, and well, kind of not lucky, but the, there's a little problem going on 
Um, it's a good thing that you outsource a lot to uh, car services and Ubers. Um, because going in those giant vans is very inefficient. But the drivers of these car services don't always know they're picking up a person with a disability. Um, there's many levels of internet between me using an app to summon a vehicle and them coming to pick me up. So they don't always know I'm disabled. Um, and they also don't know, many, many of them don't know that they can be reimbursed for the tolls or that it's part of their fare. So if I'm in Bay Ridge and want to get here, they make the long trip over to the Brooklyn and Manhattan Bridge and they don't take the battery tunnel and they waste a lot of time. Their time, our time, they burn more gas, they cause more congestion. Um, yesterday, there was a, in AM New York, there was a little article, questions and answers about how to deal with this. And the answer to this question was, we should complain to the MTA. Um, I don't want to complain after I'm late to work. I want to be able to hand the driver a document that says, you know, you're being reimbursed for the toll. If there was some sort of, you know, when we're in an accessoride vehicle, there's a placard with uh, the passenger's rights and responsibilities. But we're, when we're in an Uber, they don't know we're disabled. They don't know it's accessoride. They don't know they get reimbursed for the toll. And they don't always know enough English to have a discussion. I don't want to start fighting with the driver. I wish we had like a card that we can hand them with our, you know, hey, I'm disabled and please take me on the shortest, fastest, safest route because the tolls don't matter because it's the MTA and it's your toll. Um, thank you for the time. Um, I hope this can be addressed. Thank you for your remarks. Our next speaker will be Betsy Plum, followed by Jackie Spellin. Good morning. My name is Betsy Plum, and I have the privilege of being executive director of Riders Alliance. We are New York's grassroots organization of subway and bus riders dedicated to building a more just and sustainable New York through safe, reliable, and affordable public transit. I am here today to speak about the urgent need to address the MTA's mounting fiscal challenges by delivering a plan to phase in six-minute service on buses and trains all day, every day. You will be hearing this morning from Riders Alliance members who are public transit riders from across the city depending on our buses and subways. For them and millions of others, long waits don't just mean inconvenience and frustration. It means getting fired because your train made you late to work or not taking the job in the first place because it would be too hard to commute there. It means picking your children up late from daycare and having to pay extra fees while you leave your kid hanging. And it means feeling unsafe uncomfortable and exposed while waiting at a bus stop for 20, 30, even 40 minutes late in the evening or in bad weather. We talk to riders about these concerns every day. And we know that for people who are riding right now, reducing punishingly long wait times, especially off peak and on the weekends is key to improving their commutes. Implementing more service would be a particular game changer for bus riders. Rising rents have pushed many far from the core of our city to its edge. The steep price of housing affordability is less frequent transit and more transfers to reach most destinations. Six minute service brings more opportunity within reach for those who need it the most. Few understand the importance of public transit more than the people sitting in this room right now, as well as the existential fiscal challenges faced by the MTA. That is why we are calling on Governor Hochul to invest in a positive vision for public transit, funding to first resolve the fiscal cliff and an additional targeted and critical investment to improve service and grow ridership over the long term. Thank you. Thank you for your remarks. Our next speaker will be Jackie Spellin, followed by Miles Grant. Good afternoon. Hello everyone, my name is Jackie Spellman. I'm the president of the Riverton Tennis Association located on 135th Street, one, within 138th Street between Park and Fifth and Harlem. Our zip code is 137, our zip code is 137. I'm here today because on the June 22nd, 2022, I and a thousand of other residents of Riverton Square, Lincoln Houses and Lenox Terrace Houses learned that the BX33 bus no longer stopped at Madison Avenue on 135th Street, either eastbound and westbound. While the Madison Avenue stop will continue to serve the M1 bus commuters, westbound travelers will now have to walk to 135th Street and 5th Avenue for the stop of the BX33 services. Many people try to exit the bus to get off 
for their last stop, but they didn't even know that that bus stop was no longer in service. So they had to ride across the bridge to the Bronx and try to find their way back home. While one avenue may not sound like a huge difference, it can pose significant um, difficulties for at least hundreds of residents who are mature, physically challenged, or both. Some of these physically challenged small kids with little legs, the dis disabled, and the senior residents will now have to walk two blocks to catch the BX-33 at a less convenient stop. Moreover, there is no bus shelter on 135th and 5th Avenue bus stop. The location also become congested during rush hour for much of the school year as the children um, gather out with their parents. My neighbors and I are totally dis disappointed and upset as the Madison bus BX stop have successfully served residents who need the stop for over centuries. The, um, the brute stop and closure of this stop combined with the lack of MTA public outreach to Manhattan portion of the BX 33 line of the community input during the bus um, Bronx bus design phase contradict the mission of the MTA preserve and enhance the quality of life through the cost and efficient provision of safe on time, reliable, and clean transportation. I respectfully ask the MTA to reinstate the BX33, both eastbound and southbound, and Manhattan, 135th Street, and Madison. Happy holidays, everyone. Thank you for this time. I look forward to hearing from you all. Thank you. Thank you for your remarks. Our next speaker will be Miles Grant, followed by Jackie Feliz. Okay, we can return back to Miles at another time. Our next speaker will be Jackie Feliz, followed by Pedro Valdez Rivera. Hello, my name is Jacqueline Feliz. I am a Riders Alliance member. I am here to talk about six minute service as a mother, as a mother of two, six minute service is important to me. I have to pick up my daughter from school at 2 p.m. and the buses are not always on time. Most of the times they show up late. I often have to go to the bus stop 40 minutes earlier just to catch it. I have been late picking up my daughter from school, which is a huge problem. And I know the same happens to other moms because of unreliable public transportation. When I show up to pick my daughter up from school late, the teachers have to stay behind and wait till I get there. This takes away for them to finish their tasks for the day. So they get home, they end up getting home late and to their own families. Poor and unreliable negative, negatively impacts, impacts me as a woman and mother. I am sick of having to board crowded buses with my stroller. If buses came every six minutes, there would be less crowding and there would be more for mothers to bring their strollers on the bus. I have been left behind because there is no room on the bus for my stroller and I have to wait 30 minutes for the next bus. It doesn't have to be this way. I'm calling on the MTA and the governor to give riders like me six minute service. Thank you for your remarks. Our next speaker will be Pedro Valdez Rivera, followed by Esteban Segura. Thank you for hearing my testimony today. My name is Pedro Valdez Rivera, and I am a resident of the Nitra Elva Roosevelt Houses in Bedford Stuyvesant, Brooklyn, New York, where I have lived since January 2016. I work as a freelancing muralist for a local nonprofit organization known as El Puente and commute every day to work. I am here today to explain why investing in six-minute service is so important to me and to riders across the city. I may ride the B38 bus from my place of residence to either downtown Brooklyn for medical appointments or commute to my trip by transferring from the B38 bus to the subway into Manhattan for additional medical appointments. 
during the majority of my time, I need to wait at least 15 minutes for a B38 bus in which two or even three buses show up at my stop, making the specific service inconsistent and unreliable. This could lead to massive overcrowding during the day, especially during off peak hours. As a result, I'm leaving about 30 minutes earlier to get to these medical appointments on time. With six minutes service, it can save me several hours each month, which could be essential in taking care of my disabled mother at home and spending more time with my family. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for your remarks. Um, Esteban Cigar is our next speaker, and then we're going to try and see if Miles is available over Zoom. Um, all right. Good uh, afternoon. Uh, to start, I'd like to thank the board for taking the time and attention to hear this. Uh, my name is Esteban Segura. I'm uh, currently an undergraduate student at Queens College. Uh, I commute every day from East Flushing, where I grew up and have lived for uh, a good portion of my life. Uh, take it from a student's perspective. Uh, the buses and the subways that run through Queens, uh, the Q25, the Q65, the 7, are still characterized by poor service. Um, they're consistently late, extremely overcrowded, and some often don't even show up. Um, as you can see, that deficient service would greatly impact my education. Uh, it, it does. Um, I often miss lectures, classes, exams, stuff that I pay for um, out of my own pocket. Um, I've already dug myself deeply into debt, you know, trying to pay for my own education, and I don't have the money to afford to have to retake classes or to prolong my education because I'm missing school. Um, so I am here to ask the board to invest in six-minute service, um, you know, not only so uh, people like me, um, public university students can uh, get to their education more reliably and more frequently, but so that we have the freedom to pursue um, pursue and attend uh, our education so we can better not only ourselves, but uh, our often underserved communities. Um, thank you. Thank you for your remarks. Our next speaker will be Miles Grant over Zoom, followed by Alicia Rock. So we will try and get Miles back later once again. So our next speakers will be Alicia Rock, followed by Michelangelo Ball Van Z. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here today and for hearing the testimonies of riders like us who use your transit system daily. My name is Alicia and I was born and raised in Queens. I would like to tell you about the dilemma that has brought me here today. I'm a full-time law student and I work part-time only one day a week because school is a lot. Every week, my shift ends between 10 p.m. and 11 p.m. At that time of night, the bus that I take to and from work arrives only every half hour. If my team gets out of the building at 10.20, I'm good. I have a solid 10 minutes to walk to the bus stop and catch the 10.30 bus. But most of the time, we get out at an annoying time like 10.28 or 10.32. Then I've missed the 10.30 bus, the next one arriving at 11. That's literally a 30 minute wait on top of my regular commute. The best part is when the scheduled bus doesn't show up at all. The bus that I've been waiting for for a full 30 minutes doesn't come and I have to wait an additional 30 minutes for the next one. Yes, on occasion, a scheduled bus will never arrive at the first stop, extending my wait time to a full hour. It goes without saying that such long, such long wait times, especially late at night, are ridiculous. Six minute service would quite literally revolutionize my commute. Knowing that it's six minutes until the next bus would mean I wouldn't have to literally sprint to the bus stop. With subways, with subways and buses running six minutes apart, 24 seven, even weekends, means I get more time at home with my fur baby Finn, instead of waiting at the bus stop. 
To you, it could be an extra few minutes to sleep in the morning and less time waiting on abandoned platforms wondering if maybe you should have just taken an Uber. It means safer service, less crowded trains and buses, and a better ride for everyone, not just those working the nine to five. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your remarks. Our next speaker will be Michelangelo Ball Van Zee, followed by Kit Garrett. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Michelangelo. Uh, thanks for uh, giving customers like us the chance to give you guys input and thanks for all the good work that you guys do every day. Um, yeah, I'm gonna start at a high level. Like when we think about transit and what's important, uh, what fundamentally matters? Does it go where we wanna go? And how long will it take for us to get there? Um, when I talk to friends, family, and other New Yorkers I know, um, the most common thing I hear from them is that transit takes too long to get there. What do they actually mean by that? They don't mean that the train doesn't go fast enough in the tunnel. They mean that they have to wait too long for the train. Now, I, I have a confession to make. I grew up in Manhattan. You know, my local station had the four, five, six trains and the N and R lines there. Um, you know, so, so I didn't really understand when people would complain about waiting for the train what that actually meant. Um, because fact is, you know, it was a couple minutes. You know, I didn't realize why, why people were making this such a big deal. You know, n now I'm fortunate enough to have a different perspective uh, living in Brooklyn along the F and G lines, which, um, you know, I'm fortunate enough to say those lines in terms of where they go, they actually take me m most places that I want to go to. The issue is, you know, with the headways being, you know, 15 minutes sometimes during the day, and 20 minutes at night, uh, you know, I, I don't know when I'm gonna get there. Um, you know, the sad part is that I doubt I'm the only one uh, to feel this way. Um, I think lots of people find themselves taking other modes of transportation just because, you know, even though they'd like to take the subway in an alternative universe with more frequent service, um, you know, the way things work today, it's not frequent enough for them to get where they need to go um, on the timelines that they need to count on. Thank you all for listening. Appreciate um, your good work. Thank you for your remarks. Our next speaker will be Kit Garrett, followed by Paul Friedman. Good morning. Thank you for hearing my testimony today. My name is Kit Garrett, and I was born in New York City and I reside in Chelsea. I support the six minute service. I work as a licensed New York City tourist guide acting as an ambassador for our city. And daily, I'm looking at locals and visitors who are stunned at the filthy subway stairs and platforms. They need to be hosed down, not just swept. Fair evasion, either jumping the turnstiles or holding the door open. Long waits between buses and trains leading to frustration and fear of being on the platforms and sidewalks longer than necessary. Countdown clocks that don't work. Dogs on leashes rather than in carriers in the subway, especially on weekends. Subway dancers and aggressive panhandlers. Lack of police on the platforms with the tracks, even though some officers are stationed upstairs, especially on the A, C, and E lines at 42nd Street. It's scary waiting on the subway platforms for trains to arrive while people with mental health issues are wandering around. The bus from Lincoln Center to Chelsea has been a 45 minute wait, standing in the cold, wind, and rain. If the transit system ran no more than six minutes apart, people, more people would feel safe and use the system, increasing revenue, decreasing frustration and pollution from so many private cars, taxis, and ride shares. The situation is so bad that many of our small businesses in Chelsea are having a difficult time hiring staff because they're afraid to use the public service at night. The six-minute service is so important to me, our local businesses, and our tourism sector for guests and riders. Thank you for your time. 
Thank you for your remarks. Our next speaker will be Paul Friedman, followed by Alfred Lynch, Jr. First of all, thank you very much for letting me speak to you today, and thank you for all that you do to keep our city running. Uh, my name is Paul Friedman. I'm a resident of the Upper West Side, where I've lived for 11 years. I'm also a member of the Riders Alliance. I've managed large teams in New York City where employees rely on the subway to get to work and also personally commute and use transit for routine transportation. I am here to explain why investing in six-minute service is so important to me, businesses operating in New York, and to riders across the city. There have been many times where I have personally arrived at a subway station and have seen wait times that make, would make me late for an appointment or event. I am lucky enough to be able to bike or pay for a ride share as an alternative at those times, but there is no reason I should have to do this. I've had teams of several hundred employees that need to get to work for their shifts in a 24-7 operation. There were many times where employees would be emailing managers pictures of countdown clocks to try and explain why they would be late for work. While we all sympathized with the challenges of the MTA reliability, in a union organization, there were strict time and attendance policies that needed to be followed. Many of these employees were second chance employees or struggling to get out of a period of hardship. Unfortunately, time and attendance issues were often the reason that employees would lose their employment. This was a very challenging situation for these employees. At the same time, this is a very challenging situation for employers. Running a business in New York City is even more complex if you cannot rely on your workforce being on time. This is especially challenging when the business runs 24-7 and has shifts starting overnight and on weekends. Schedules were created to assume there would be employees late or missing work, often due to transportation issues. This increases the cost and complexity of business operations in New York City. The ease and attractiveness of operating in New York City increases with more reliable transportation for employees. I ask that the MTA works towards a minimum of six-minute service to help riders and businesses in New York City. Thank you very much. Thank you for your remarks. Our next speaker will be Alfred Lynch, Jr., followed by Victor Walker. Transit, activists, and everybody else. Uh, I'm Alfred Lynch, Jr., a resident of Co-op City for the Bronx for 30 years. Also retired M uh, MAP store bus operator for 26 years, current Riders Alliance member for six years. Now, I commute daily to make my doctor's appointments, visit relatives, volunteer, and enjoy cultural and entertainment activities in the Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island, Westchester County, and New Jersey. I'm here to explain today why investing in a six-minute service is so important to me and to the riders across the city. Infrequent bus service leaves riders waiting longer on platforms and bus stops. Because of travel patterns, women, people of color, and low-income service workers are more likely to be less safe by infrequent service. Now, the six-minute service means more job opportunities, getting your children to daycare schools on time, a chance to enjoy activities in the city, reduce the number of cars on the road, it's a safety issue and also clean air. Uh, thank you for uh, the time today. Thank you for your remarks. Our next speaker will be Victor Walker, followed by a private, uh, our final speaker, CN. Good morning, everyone. My name is Victor Walker. I'm a resident of the Bronx. I'm a poet. And I'm also a member of the Writers Alliance. Excuse me. I frequently take the BX13 bus, where I transfer to the 4 train, which is a very, very busy station. It's pretty crowded at that station. And sometimes I wait 20 to 30 minutes for a bus to come. And when it arrives, it's packed and people rush to push their way into the bus. Some of you may be able to see that I carry a cane, and so I stand at the front. And sometimes the bus driver doesn't let people know to move to the back, and sometimes people don't let me have a seat. So I sometimes have to get off the bus and wait for the next bus, which is usually 20 to 30 more minutes, and it's usually packed. It takes me so long to get home 
that sometimes I just stay home. Uh, this kind of unreliable uh, commute, coupled with the lack of resources, coupled with not having enough food, not having uh, the resources that I need is a big weight on me. Uh, sometimes I choose to stay home rather than come out at all because I, I, I just feel that there's too much for me to come out and, and, and battle with 20-minute wait times. But today I ask you to really seriously consider six-minute service. I heard some folks talk about what's feasible. Let's talk about what's possible. There are so many things throughout our history that were unfeasible until we decided that we were going to do those things. And I'm asking you to not focus on that, but focus on what is possible. Uh, riders need reliable transportation services today. We know that MTA means Metropolitan Transportation Authority. Let's make it mean more than just that. Thank you very much. Thank you for your remarks. Our final speaker will be CN. Hi. Um, so I'm really grateful that uh, Access Ride passengers like me have the eHealth on demand program because uh, it's really important to have an on demand service, and I'm really grateful for that. And uh, it's a service that isn't designed to replace paratransit. But what I'm not for are passengers on the eHealth demand program who have disabilities but are, who are not on welfare programs like SSI and SSDI who could afford to book an accessible Uber, who could afford to book an accessible taxi using the service. And I think we could save a lot of money if we means test the eHealth On Demand program to weed out those who could afford, if they wanted to, the Uber and the uh, private car service, instead of benefiting off of the $2.75 ride, that really should be for passengers uh, much more deserving who uh, are on welfare. As it comes to rationing, if uh, the MTA is going to ration these uh, rides, I think it's important not to ration the rides from the passenger's destination back to their home. Uh, because, you know, no, uh, passengers might not know exactly when they're going to uh, need the pick up back home. But I could understand if rationing was for the ride from the passenger's home to the destination where they could use a mixture of paratransit, the traditional accessory van, and the eHealth on demand program, like a mixture to get to where they're going. And um, instead, uh, it's important not to ration the rides uh, returning back to the person's home. And that's how I feel. I think we could uh, save some money that way. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your participation and comments. This concludes the public comment session. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, your remarks. I'd now like to make a motion to approve the minutes from the October 2020 meeting. Andrew, we're good? OK. All those in favor? Aye. Great. Motion carried. Rich, you want to walk us through the changes, any changes in the work plan? Uh, of course, Chair. So this month, we're removing the fair evasion report and biannual customer survey report for the work from the work plan as we are going to move that data directly to our website. Other than that, there are no proposed changes to the work plan or the transit committee charters this year. Great. Thank you. You want to start us off with the president's report? Absolutely. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, riding the system and asking customers how the transit system is working for them is what we have been focused on uh, at transit. Answers vary, uh, but that's a good thing. Uh, our newly announced North Star goal is to increase our customer satisfaction by at least 10% across the board by June of 2024. We're hovering around 60% across all modes, which is a, hist a high over the last five years, and, but I know we can do better. Listening to our riders is going to be key to our success. Listening through our regular monthly surveys of our customers, also our transit talks, is central to our operations plan that we pr uh, proposed or uh, brought to the board uh, last month, our faster, cleaner, safer plan. 
And according to surveys, as mentioned, the top five service attributes that our customers will say improve service are faster, more frequent service. We heard that today. Cleaner stations and vehicles, a safer environment. Better weekend service and enhancing customer communications, particularly during incidents, um, unplanned incidents. So how are we doing? In October, the bus experience, uh, overall satisfaction increased by three percentage points from 62 to 65 percent. Customers are consistently sharing with us that improving their travel and wait times would further improve their satisfaction on bus. The bus network redesigns, as mentioned, I think, from the public earlier, are a major project intended to directly address these concerns. The Staten Island Express bus redesign network and the Bronx local bus redesign network continue to show positive trends after implementation. Our draft but Brooklyn bus network redesign will include changes to local and express buses, which will be released later this year, maybe sooner rather than later. Uh, and we're also targeting to finalize the Queens bus uh, network redesign by early next year. We're also excited to announce the additional bus lane improvement on Pelham Bay Park, um, where our, our partners at Pelham Parkway, thank you, yes, I've been corrected multiple times now by, uh, as you would expect, by the uh, ever detailed um, member Albert. Um, with our partners in New York City DOT uh, are painting the line red. This new bus uh, contraflow lane is finished. We'll be able to reroute the BX12 SBS in a more direct path to Co-op City. We're also tracking, as you all know, outcome-based metrics in our ob uh, obsession through tools like Substat, Busstat, and Parastat, uh, the three um, CompStat, if you will, um, uh, programs that Demetrius, Frank, and Chris run on a regular basis. Um, in terms of the faster, cleaner, and safer initiatives, Chair, if you would indulge me, I'd like to actually ask uh, a couple of folks to go a little deeper on a couple of the initiatives uh, that we are, um, that we're undertaking. And look, I'm as excited as, I don't know if Murray is still here, Murray Bowden, who spoke about pre-tech and the work that Frank and the bus team have been doing to improve uh, predictive maintenance in bus. But we have Jer uh, Jesse Sater here to give a very short presentation on what I think is leading the country in transit here in New York on predictive maintenance. Jesse? Or Frank, do you want to kick, kick it off? Yeah, uh, Murray, Murray stole some of my thunder, but. Uh, you obviously coordinated, which so, I'm all in favor of. So yeah, I'll tee up, Jesse. So good morning. Um, so part, as part of the Transit Tech Lab, Bus has, has been working with a company called Pretech, a company that offers vehicle prognostics powered by artificial intelligence, or AI, to pilot their technology on a fleet of our buses. The AI sifts through millions of performance data points available in our current uh, telematic systems and creates maintenance repair plans before the failures actually occur. As a result, our team is able to identify and address issues before they lead to failures on the road, and it helps our maintainers make effective repairs at the first time around and improves operating efficiencies, increasing service reliability ultimately for our customers. So, you know, in short, we're leveraging mega, mega data from our current telematic systems to optimize our bus maintenance. We're excited to begin deploying this technology to 1,500 buses across the fleet. And now we'll turn it over to Jesse, who will go a little bit deeper for this. Thanks, Jesse. No, thanks, Frank. Um, this seems to be the talk of the town nowadays, uh, pre-tech, so I'll just give some brief comments on it. So what is predictive maintenance? Uh, as Frank alluded to, it's machine learning that uh, leverages massive amounts of data from the bus telematics system to create precision repair actions before the failure occurs. So another way of looking at this is you have a huge amount of data. We have that. And you want to make the data useful. So what this particular system does is it teases out the signal from the noise and really that's what it effectively does and so we use that as one of our tools really to, to help us diagnose the buses um, before they fail um, so pretect is a maintenance tool pretect provides vehicle predictive maintenance and precision repair plans um, the transit tech lab put us in contact obviously with the company and we embarked on a two-year uh, pilot program. We tried to do a proof of concept as to whether or not this would actually work. Um, the results were positive. Uh, it unfolded in three phases. During the phases, we wanted to, to validate the predictive alerts. 
we wanted to validate the repair plans, and we wanted to measure the business impact. So it happened in three, three basic um, phases. The reason why we chose the 326 buses is it was a population sample that would give us good feedback as to whether or not this was working. And we also focused it on a specific uh, system on the bus, which is, we call it the after treatment, but it's basically just the exhaust system on the bus. It gives us um, reliable data, but also is actual defects you'll get out in the street that causes the bus to road call. So we wanted to see if that was, you know, uh, something that we could have an effect on. So the pilot results, um, we improved customer experience by reducing road calls and service interruptions. Um, a big one was improved the bus availability. Um, machine learning, this is sort of an offshoot, what we learned from it. Uh, machine learning aids are troubleshooting the complex issues. The buses are becoming more and more complex as we go through uh, the different iterations of buses, so it helps us with that. Um, it reduces the work stress, um, 100 million performance data points, 10,000 fault codes, basically created 50 actionable repair plans. And it also optimizes the maintenance, reduces the labor hours and material costs. So that's a good thing that we uh, had from the pilot results. Another thing we found is that when we're able to get ahead of these defects before they really turn into something significant, we're able to do some actionable maintenance and it helps us with collateral damage to other systems. So that's another positive that we found. Um, a case study that just sort of gives you an example of what we uh, experienced during this uh, pilot program is two buses, bus 5827 and 5808, experienced the same maintenance issue with their after treatment system, requiring the DPF differential pressure sensor to be replaced. In the case of bus 5808, the repair plan was used, enabling the maintainer to make an informed decision not to replace the HC doser. This saved time and material versus the other bus, which did not use the repair plan. And below there on the screen, you can just sort of uh, pick your way through that. You can, it's pretty obvious that we saved, obviously, a lot in materials, which is important. Our next steps is to expand the after treatment uh, predictive maintenance to approximately 1,500 buses. Um, invest in the training of maintenance staff to enhance predictive maintenance effectiveness. Transition to other systems, such as our engine and HVAC systems. And we'll continue to use the bus telematics um, for diagnostics and bus performance data. So that's basically uh, the brief summary of Pretect, and uh, it looks pretty promising. That's, oh, I think Andrew has a question. I don't Andrew, know. Yeah, yeah, please. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, when, Frank, when you said this was uh, across the fleet, does that mean depots in all five boroughs? Yeah, I'd have to get the exact locations of the 1500, but it's the same like and kind buses. And this, the 1500 will actually be in, uh, effectuating the exhaust after treat system, after treatment system, um, which is a com one of the most complex systems on the buses. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions for Frank? Jess, thank you. Go ahead. Great. Thanks, Jess. Appreciate it. Um, moving to cleaner, um, this past summer, many of you know, we launched a new station refresh program, which we have now re-rebranded. It was Mop My <laughs> Stop, and I think that, frankly, undersold all the good work that Demetrius, Jim, and the team was doing. And we are rebranding it to Renewvation. Um, to deep clean, tackle some more visible problems in stations, lighting, missing uh, tiles, for example, seeing if we can put down tactile warning strips when in there, but basically utilizing the station closures uh, that are a re result of GOs for track or signal work, power work, and actually going in and doing a big um, renovation, if you will, a renovation. So I'll let Demetrius uh, tee it up, and I think Jim Compton's gonna just talk a little bit about uh, what we've done and frankly where we're headed. Thanks, Rich. Um, the subways team heard your challenge and we accepted it to take advantage of the weekend closures to improve the customer environment and come up with new and innovative ways to, to make a better impact on the customer env environment when the uh, system is closed down on the weekend. Um, when customers return, there are elements of the system that they will see that has improved. Um, and so I'll have Jim talk, Jim Compton, who's the executive vice president for station environment 
and facilities. He'll talk a little bit about the program, uh, what we've done so far for uh, 2022, as well as the plans for 2023 moving out. Jim. Good afternoon. As Dimitri has stated, I'm here today to brief you on the New York City Transit, Transit Station Renovation Program. This presentation will cover overview of the program and its goal, planning process, how stations are selected, the scope of work, what we, what we plan to do, what we did in 2022, and our plan for 2023. So what is the station renovation program? First, we will perform required station maintenance, including deep cleaning to enhance the customer environment and remove gum. Second, we will perform employee facility maintenance to address defects and enhance employee morale. Third, we will perform maintenance of way infrastructure improvements. This is work performed along the right of way associated with track, drains, and signals. These tasks are performed while capitalizing on existing 48 hour weekend station outage. The goal, increase customer and employee satisfaction. What goes into selecting the stations? First, along with operations planning, we identify weekend station outages associated with project work. We communicate with construction and development and listen to what pro construction projects they have going on so we do not uh, duplicate our efforts. We evaluate current station conditions. We take into account feedback from the group station managers. We evaluate the greatest impact to our customers when selecting stations. We take into account weather conditions, whether or not it's an outdoor elevated station versus an underground uh, below ground station, and also the significance of the work that's required. I think we needed to add a seventh, which was the transit committee's input. So to the extent there are stations that uh, might not be on the upcoming list, uh, we're obviously open to feedback, right, Jim? Of course. So what, what goes into a station renovation? Required tasks, addressing open station maintenance trouble tickets, specialized, performing specialized cleaning, teams will power wash and perform detailed cleaning and gum removal. We will refresh employee facilities. Additional tasks include tile replacement and regrouting, column and floor repairs, installation repairs of lighting fixtures. That makes a huge improvement at the station, the lighting, when the lighting is all changed out uniformly. Painting, staircase repairs and painting, installation and repair of drains, Globe lighting installations at the exterior. As you enter the station, you see that the lights are properly lit. And MOW infrastructure improvements. 2022 success stories. As you heard, Rich challenged us, President Davey challenged us uh, earlier this summer to implement this program. We identified the concourse line, the structural rehabilitation project on the B and D lines to piggyback. And today, well, we identified nine stations out of 11 weekend outages. To date, we have completed six. That was Norwood, 205th Street, 182, 183rd Street, 170th Street, Fordham Road, Kingsbridge, and Tremont. In December, we will address three additional stations, Bedford Park Boulevard, 167th Street, and 174, 175th Street. These are some photos of work that was performed at Norwood 205th Street. There was some wall tile replacement, track ceiling, scraping, and painting. 170th Street, we had some sidewalk repair. We overhead painting, before and after photos. Fordham Road, this is track tile replacement. And Next up in 2023, our goal is 50 stations. In the first quarter, we will address 12 stations. And in January, we plan on doing 21st Street on the G Line, DeKalb Avenue on the L Line, Morgan Avenue on the L Line, and Delancey Essex on the J Line. Thank you.
question. Yes. Uh, when, Rich, when you uh, told us that the concourse line was going to undergo this kind of work, um, I asked at the time, and I think it's just as important now, when you're going to shut down sections of a line or specific stations, are you making any arrangements for additional service elsewhere? In the case of the concourse line, you've got the four line just a few blocks away. That was a logical one. And I was told by someone in ops planning at that time, no, we're not doing that. I hope that when you look to future uh, construction, like such as the, uh, what's going on in the concourse line now, that you do look at getting riders where they need to go um, and doing something to nearby service or bus lines to nearby services or something in that nature. Just for, for certain, and I know that operations planning, if, well, first, I think the idea of having Jose LaSalle be our sort of weekend diversion is really what he's focused on, but I, I think his scope, Demetrius, is fair to say is beyond diversions now because he's really taken a hold for all weekend service, which is great. But that was the initial brain challenge. It was to actually have someone who could coordinate across the departments and look. I think we will, you know, we look at anticipated ridership to see if there's additional service that's required or, you know, what kind of a bus uh, diversion, bus bridge, if you will, is required. Uh, but no, we'll continue to look at that, particularly as ridership continues to grow and particularly as ridership on weekends exactly. continues to grow faster than weekdays. That's amongst the weekday. highest riding times. Correct. Thank you. Majori. Thank you. So I'm, I'm really excited both about the predictive maintenance because I, I worked a little bit on the transit tech lab. So it's great to see that, you know, five years later, it's still around and bringing in new vendors into the fold um, and creates a much more competitive mix of what technologies you can bring in. Um, on the renovation, really excited because I think Rich, you know, just want to praise you on your commitment to customer service and the staff as well. And this notion of like listening to the riders. It's not like we haven't listened to riders before, but I feel like that's really prominent in the way that you're leading. So that's really critical. And I think in your president's report, you said, you know, customers consistently share that improving wait times, improving frequency, that's what's going to increase satisfaction. That's what's going to bring them back. So, and we heard that today. So, you know, some things that just stick with me with the public comment period was, you know, sometimes I choose to stay home instead of going out at all. So knowing that um, there are statistics that we see every month about customer satisfaction increasing, you have a great goal of it increasing. We also hear these stories, right? And these stories are pretty impactful. So really appreciate that. And I really think, um, Jim, your focus on lighting. I was going to ask about lighting because I think when we think about safety and when we think about, you know, what is within MTA's control in terms of improving safety operations, light is it you know if I'm out at 11 or midnight and I promise I'm working when I'm doing that you know it's to go home you want I want to not have to wait 20 minutes but I also want to have some light and that helps too so I really really appreciate that I think the fact that you're doing 50 next year is ambitious and great um, had a quick question about if there's any thinking about tactile strips on the platform, like what's going on there? Is there any possibilities as we also think about kind of ADA needs? Yeah, no, it's a great question. So in fact, we have incorporated, we did incorporate it with a, one, at least one or two stations, Jim, I'll let you identify those, but we are working closely with Q and his team to see where we can. Um, depending on the size and length of station, it can be a, um, a costly or at least extend beyond the weekend. So we're trying to balance that as well. So we also have some capital um, you know, our uh, Jamie's team also has some dollars within the C&D budget to address that as well. But Jim, why don't you talk a little bit about what we were able to do, at least in this initial round? Sure. Um, earlier this month, we definitely did Fordham, um, Fordham Road and 170th Street. There might have been another one as well on the concourse line that was done. And we are, you know, working closely with um, C&D and maintenance of W. Uh, we address the locations, the stations that do not have the tactile edge and we have a plan in 2023 to to um, further that project along so so did i hear that right it requires capital involvement mm -hmm. to do the tactile strips sometimes it depends okay. on the length of the station or how um you know the, the size of the station i guess okay. is like the lengths are generally the okay. same but the size of the station right so that's been um i think one of the uh, challenges or if we actually have to do then edge work um, I observed it uh, myself. Some of it's actually a little easier than, than others, oh, but okay. that is um, one of the challenges. And lastly, I think for the C and D refreshes, they've got already programmed, you know, an ADA work in the future. 
Um, so we have said in that instance, we would defer uh, potentially from an operating budget perspective, defer a year or two out and, mm. and from a C and D perspective. But again, we're, we're balancing it to see if we can expedite, um, you know, expedite that's not an amenity, obviously. It's, it's an important um, part of the station environment, particularly for our customers who are visible, you know, visually impaired. Yeah, I mean, we're putting so much capital into making sure that all our stations or, you know, a certain amount of our stations become wheelchair accessible and accessible for those struggling with mobility issues. This actually is a lower amount in terms versus like putting it. So it's like one element, one complement to the whole station design. So I just wanted to raise it. Nope, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Go on, Rich. Great. Um, thanks, Jim. Thanks, Demetrius. And look forward to uh, the continued uh, rollout. And obviously, I think we're putting out a full list for the quarter, uh, depending, as, as Jim said, on uh, weather and whatnot. But we're very confident that 50 is uh, actually not that ambitious. We think we can get it done. So uh, we're excited at it. Well, I think the chair would uh, push us to list, do even Jim, more. But that's okay. uh, yes, exactly. Um, I'm waiting for the chair to bust in through that door and say uh, 50 is not uh, is not ambitious enough. Um, moving on to subway. So subway experience um, and, and safety in particular, uh, overall satisfaction decreased by three points from 59 percent to 56 percent in October. The decrease was largely driven um, around the question of customers feeling safe in our stations and on our trains. Two-thirds of customers stated in the October Pulse now uh, that there were too few uniformed police officers uh, in the system. This was before uh, the governor and the mayor's announcement to put additional 1,200 officers in the stations as they have now over the last month. And as I hope folks have seen, I've certainly seen it, they are patrolling platforms and making themselves known to our conductors and trains as they pass through the stations. We are now making announcements uh, as trains pull into stations where we have police either presence or police stations within the station to let customers know, one, that there are officers present. You may not be able to see them. It's, uh, it's they're usually stationed in the middle of the platform, um, but also that if there are any issues or questions that that can be reported. I also, and obviously the chief will have more to say, but we've been working very closely together these past months and certainly uh, over these past weeks to really be focused um, a station by station where we need to be um, focused on. But the other one I want to uh, discuss briefly and have Bobby Deal talk about is the results for our pilot program for the unarmed guards at Gates. And this is in particular focused on fare evasion. The guards are not empowered to make arrests. They're not empowered uh, to stop folks or stop crime. They can certainly call the police if they see an issue, but this is specifically designed as a methodology to, uh, to deter fare evasion. So Bobby, do you want to just spend a, a minute on, on that? Sure, absolutely. So we launched two types of guard pilots over the last six months. Uh, armed guards in front of MetroCard vending machines which make it easier for our customers to pay the fare by reducing vandalism of the MVMs and reducing the machine repair downtime. The second one is unarmed guards in front of the emergency exit gates to reduce fare evasion by preventing unauthorized use of the gate. Uh, in both types of pilots, our stations with guards have full coverage. And what I mean by that is that if there's a group of MVM machines, there will be a guard in front of it. And the same with the gates. It's not like we're covering one gate and not the other. We have to cover all the gates with this. So we're, we're just starting to beginning to obtain data that we really need to understand how effective these pilots are. And we're going to be monitoring that over the next couple of weeks and months to see where it actually leads us to. So if I go to slide two. So this is, you know, I'd like to share one of the promising results from our preliminary analysis of the MetroCard vending machine pilot at Myrtle and Wyckoff Station. Uh, we introduced armed guards there back in early May, and we did expect to see some sort of direct effect as far as the, uh, the MetroCard sales that were there. If you look at the dash line, which shows the MVM sales throughout the pilot period of us having guards there, as it compares to the 12 week prior of what we have, you can see that it's very promising. Okay, by having the guards at those locations. Good questions? I'm sorry. In May or June, and then we Correct. made it them was, unarmed? Correct. We, we actually we started off with, well, we actually started off with armed guards first at the MVM machines. <clears throat> 
And we later, you know, after discussion, we decided let's introduce some unarmed guards mm -hmm. at the gates. Because although we were having positive results with the MVM machines, there was still a certain amount of fare evasion that was occurring at the station. And if you've been in any of our stations at times, you see that once that gate is open, it's like Black Friday in Macy's. You know, I'm yeah. sorry. Once that gate's open, the floodgates are open and people come in. So, you know, the more that we control that gate, the less fare evasion we can have at a station. It doesn't deter it completely, but you know what? We, we're able to deter a good part of it. Mm -hmm. Matoy? Thank you, Bob. Appreciate it. Um, so, yes, very interesting. Um, I guess I'm going to put my CFO of a former agency cap on. Uh, so do you have kind of the return on investment for putting armed guards and the revenue or the, yeah, the revenue that you collected and then the unarmed guards and the revenue that you collected just to get a sense of what we're talking about because this is at one station Correct. and I see you know the the dollar figure so getting some right. information and and absolutely okay and then the second question is then what are your success metrics like what are, is it just the you know total number of revenue that you're getting in I, I would think it's an ROI kind of breakdown but curious yeah. I, I mean at, at the end of the day I think you have a couple of things that have to be looked at here, all right? The first thing is, is of course, you can look at MetroCard sales, right? See if the MVM machines are doing what they should be doing, right? And then you have also MetroCard swipes of coming in through the station to see if people are actually using the turnstiles as opposed to using other means. Again, holding that gate is imperative to stopping half the amount of fare evasion in our stations from what we're seeing. And again, this is one station. We're, we're currently deployed out to 12 stations, but we're still gathering all that information to really make a real solid deduction on it. I, in, in this particular instance, um, we know that the net take was higher revenue, right. net of the cost of guards for Myrtle Wyckoff. There's no doubt about it. Um, you know, the guards were introduced because we were having vandalism at the MVMs, which also made you know a cost in terms of our um, in terms of our maintenance. I think it's fair to say, though, that for other stations, um, we probably the return on investment will be lower or potentially in the negative. So I think, you know, we have not put that out as the only metric, if you will, because I don't think that will work at a number of stations. I think part of it will be the customer satisfaction, you know, because we do see in the customer data, particularly in subways uh, and bus, by the way, uh, you know, concerns and challenges with with fair payment. Um, so I think that's one success metric. But certainly there's a return on investment at some stations. Myrtle Wyckoff was definitely one. So the net, again, was about, at least in May and June, it was, the net was $100,000 a month. I mean, it was significant, given the activity that was occurring to this station before May. Yeah, I think, I think I'd just be curious to look at that data and get a sense and see what we can really extrapolate from it. And maybe that's coming out in the blue ribbon work that you're all doing. So. Uh, Lisa and then Andrew. Um, so I have a quick question regarding any pushback. I mean, we see the pushback when officers try to stop someone. What kind of pushback, if any, have the guards received? Or have there been any altercations in attempting to stop yes, these individuals? Uh, there, there has been at times. Um, I, I tell you, the it, it's, hard, it's hard to quantify at times what, what you're asking about. I'm going to tell you why, because they're not police officers, all right? They're security officers. Now, by them holding the gate, what we are really trying to stop is that opportunist, all right? It's that person that once the gate's open, sees three people go through and say, hey, why not me? And then you've got eight people behind that person coming through. So a lot of times, once they have that gate under their control, people will look, and I, I've seen this at 7-4 and Roosevelt. I've seen it at West 4th Street. People come up, they queue up, they're waiting, they're waiting, and the gate doesn't open. And all of a sudden, they pull out Metro cards, and they go through the turnstile. So, you know, again, looking at opportunists as opposed to the real hardcore fare evader who doesn't care who's there is going to vault that turnstile. All right? So that's what our mission is here with doing that. You. You're welcome. Andrew? Um, in terms of the Myrtle Wyckoff um, place that you've had unarmed guards and armed guards. Correct. Has anybody monitored the adjacent stations to see if fare evasion went up at those locations? Yes, we have. And although we, we haven't really seen that, that big bounce, we actually deployed out to Halsey Street, which is an adjacent station. Yep. Yep. You know, part of this is kind of like experimentation that we're looking for cause and effect and seeing how we can de deploy, I guess, more intelligently. 
you know, just to look at areas to see where we're going to find maybe that bounce of more evasion or less evasion. Of the 12 locations that you say you have these officers, are they always the same 12? Do you rotate to other stations? Or how does it work? As of right now, it's kind of new. So, you know, we're looking at possibly an eight to 12 week deployment and then rotate around to other boroughs. We're currently in every borough except for the Bronx, and we're hoping by the end of the week to be in the Bronx also. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Any other questions? It's just going to make a point, just in terms of how we select the stations. I mean, maybe it's another question, right? Is, right. is so looking at a number of metrics, right? So it's it's um, again customer satisfaction, where we're hearing customers are saying, you know, fair evasion is is out of control, crime. So working with the chief and understanding exactly where, because I think one of our hypotheses is that, and I think Jano has said it, uh, you know, multiple times that fair evaders tend to be uh, criminals, not you know, vice versa. And so um, if we're able to prevent folks from entering the system to begin with, um, that's good news. And there are also more eyes and ears. So if they do see a crime or if they do see a known person, they can get on the phone and get transit police uh, to a station. Um, and then it's really talking to the GSM, so the station manager team, and really understanding what's happening on the ground, the station agents, the cleaners, like what are they seeing and observing? Um, so we're trying to make this very objective and data-based. And then lastly, of course, we look at um, um, you know, MVM sales and see if there are any anomalies within. So it's really trying to be a data-based push. I mean, as, as, as Bobby said, this has been a big, I think, social behavioral experiment for us that we've been quietly piloting since May, and, and I think that's why it became such a big part of, of um, uh, you know, part of the SAFE um, uh, the program that the governor and the mayor announced a few weeks ago is because we've seen real good traction um, at some key places. Thanks. Um, that leads me to one question that I wasn't going to ask, but now that you raised it. Um, the cameras that we have at the, at the turnstiles, how long are those photos maintained? That, that actually has, I'm sorry, that actually has a 30-day retention period of, you know, film, film that we take. So it's a 30-day retention. Sometimes we get a little bit more than 30 days, you know, de depending on the usage of the camera. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay. At Lisa? You know I was going to react to that statement, yes, right? Yes, yes, yes. Um, every borough except the Bronx. Yeah. Allow me to speak. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, automatic, off the top of my head, I'm thinking 149th Street, the hub. Yeah. You get hundreds of thousands jumping turnstiles, opening the doors. Why not the Bronx? Yeah, well, again, we were rolling these out to areas where we could actually have enough people to cover. All right, just like when you look at certain stations, certain stations may have X amount of gates, which is going to take a lot of resources to actually do. So, as President Davey said, we're looking at multiple different things before we actually come up with a listing of where we're going to go. You know, and again, you know, we look at MVM damage, we're, we're, we're looking at crime, we're looking at some safety issues, we're looking at a lot of things that are all brought in and then that gets sliced and diced and then we look to where we can go. <laughs> but don't worry, we'll be going to the Bronx. Any other questions? All right, we're going to move on to Q for the accessibility update. Thank you so much, Chair. First of all, I want to remind everyone to take our fall 2022 customers count survey if you have not done so yet at new.mta.info slash mta dash customers dash research. The survey includes a number of questions about accessibility features in our systems, and it's important for us, and we want to hear from a diverse representation of our customers based on what is working and what needs improvement as we come back and welcome more customers into the system. On the theme of connecting with our customers, throughout the fall, our accessibility team and our GCR Government Community Relations Group have been meeting with community boards, libraries, and senior centers on everything the MTA is doing to improve accessibility system-wide, really hearing from them on what's working and what needs more attention. We have been all over the city with more than 30 events covering every borough, helping reduce fair customers, switch to Omni, getting feedback on the open stroller pilot on buses, and educating riders on the MTA's historic commitment to station accessibility in this current capital plan. At each meeting, we ask community members to spread the word about programs and connect us with organizations and groups we should be meeting with. We ask the same of community members and those here today. If there's a group in your community that needs to know about our work on accessibility, please reach out to us so that we can connect with them. Next month, we'll be providing more detailed updates on the rollout of Omni for Reduced Fare and a check-in on the Open Shoulder Pilot as we near the halfway point of that six-month pilot. Finally, 
thanks to the Department of Subways for their continued work installing tactile warning strips, as we spoke of earlier. We have put tactile down on more than 20 platformed edges across a dozen stations during the last six months, and edges were recently completed at Fordham Road, BD, and 170th Street BD stations in the Bronx. And we have more planned work in the coming weeks on that. So thank you, Subways, for your continued partnership on that one. Any other, any questions for Q? Okay, if not, we're gonna move on to uh, <clears throat> Chief Walcox. You wanna update us, Chief? Sorry. <coughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Just, uh, I wanna, before I start, I just wanna talk uh, um, what Bobby Deal just mentioned about with the Fair Vision. I look forward to, uh, in the new year, working even, you know, more in a coordinated fashion with his efforts and our efforts um, just to to see what we can do and to really impact on fare evasion throughout the system. You know, we've done a lot of work this year, 97% increase in fare evasion arrests, 37% increase in fare evasion summonses. But I, I know we, we can do uh, more and better uh, coordinating with Bobby in the, in the new year with this effort. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. Thank you, Chief, for that. No problem. So just uh, um, good afternoon again. Yesterday was a, a special day. I was up at the uh, East 116th Street and Lexington Avenue train station on the 6th line where I was able to stand with uh, the mayor, Deputy Mayor Banks, the police commissioner, the MTA chair, of course, was there as they recognized two young police officers, uh, very young, only a few years on the job, Officer Victor and Officer Bacht, who uh, had rescued a male on Thanksgiving Day afternoon at that same station. The male had become ill uh, and fainted and then fell onto the track area. Those officers who were doing the enhanced patrol coverage at that station that President Davey mentioned uh, were alerted uh, by other riders to the situation. They quickly sprang into action, ran from one uh, platform up to the street to the other platform, and along with the help of a good Samaritan, they were able to get that aided male off the roadbed back onto the platform. And this was all done, if you see the video, uh, as the sixth train was moving towards them as it was about to enter the station. Um, that male was then removed to the hospital for treatment, and no doubt a potential tragedy was averted. Um, I think it was a proud New York moment. So, you know, last month at this meeting, I spoke on that significant initiatives uh, that are now underway to increase our presence, to increase our visibility of uniform officers throughout the subway system. This is a seven-day-a-week effort, an all-hour-of-the-day effort. A comprehensive mission involving NYPD transit, precinct, housing personnel, along with our partners at the MTA police. A mission dedicated to keep riders safe, to protect them, to make them feel safe as well, and to render aid when needed as we saw it at 116th Street. So now weeks into this effort, tens of thousands of additional uniform officer coverages have been done at over 300 stations in all boroughs since the inception of the program. In the last four weeks alone, over 108,000 station inspections have been done by transit and precinct officers. In addition, there have been nearly 33,000 train patrols performed. Last month, we also strengthened our train patrol force. We call it the TPF with additional officers. The TPF have a very important assignment, and it was touched on earlier by one of the speakers. They do uniform patrol on the trains during the overnight hours citywide. And they have done over 7,800 multi-borough, multi-train district patrol runs since this initiative, TPF initiative, started in the spring. And trust me, we're only getting started with this stuff. Uh, the additional uniform present, these station coverages, and this effort will continue throughout the holidays and into the coming year. So throughout this year, at these committee meetings, you've heard me talk about the many challenges we've encountered, um, some historic, some of the incidents of terrible violence that we've experienced, notable gun violence, stabbing and slashing assaults. Our response has been decisive when these crimes occur. Many arrests have been made. And I do want to point that our strong partnerships, like what we have here, have helped us all see our way through these incidents and kept us all focused. So, you know, when you look at the, hear the media or you hear what's the conversation, some speak on the point 
that felony crime is up this year in the transit system when compared to the last few years when the city was grappling with the pandemic. This is accurate. As the ridership continues to grow and grow through 2022, we are experiencing more felony crime incidents. We are currently up in the area of 33% in major felony crime incidents when compared to the same period from last year. And yes, we must and we will remain alert and vigilant, but New Yorkers do not frighten easily. They are strong, they are resilient, and in challenging times, New Yorkers come together, they look out for each other, and we find that way forward. As we work hard to regain a sense of safety and security in the subways, we have accomplished much this year in that effort. And we have done it with the assistance of our partners, but also with the help of New Yorkers. We saw it on Thanksgiving when a good Samaritan assisted us, but we also have seen it again and again as riders alert our officers or MTA employees to serious incidents, or they call 911, or they call our Crime Stoppers hotline to give us information to help us solve crimes. All of this determined work that I've mentioned, I believe is taking hold and yielding positive results. In the last four weeks, we have seen a crime reduction of 13% in overall major, major felony crime when compared to last year. That importantly includes a 33% decrease in robbery. In the broader context, year to date, overall major crime and transit continues to be down when compared to the pre-pandemic years. What am I talking about? Down 6% from three years ago, down 8% from four years ago, down 6% again from five years ago, and down 15% from 10 years ago. And we've also heard that the NYPD needs to enforce the laws and the rules of conduct in the transit system to keep us safe. This we know. This we are doing every single day. After the subway safety plan was established at the beginning of the year, we made a strong commitment to fight crime and give far greater attention to quality of life violations of the subways. We have not wavered on that commitment, and when an incident occurs, we address it immediately and investigate it thoroughly. Overall arrests in transit are up 45% this year. Total felony arrests are up 28%. Misdemeanor crime arrests are up nearly 50%. Robbery arrests up 45%, grand larceny arrests up 59%. So one issue we've, we've tr had trouble with all year long is felony arrests, and the, with felony assaults, I'm sorry, and those felony arrests, assault arrests are up 17% as well. With those incidents, two thirds of those incidents have an arrest uh, on them. And this includes arrests of the 90 assaults made on police officers this year. So in addition, we have made over 800 cutting instrument arrests throughout the system. So back to quality of life. Nobody knows how to navigate our subway trains and stations and enforce quality of life better than our NYPD transit officers. We have issued over 100,000 tab summonses this year for rules of conduct violations. That's a 56% increase. This includes a 37% increase in fare evasion summonses and a 171% increase in quality of life summonses. What does that entail? Up 200% in smoking summonses, up 239% in drinking summonses, and up 144% in summonses for public urination. So as the holidays are now here, there's a topical and timely crime issue that I really want to discuss. As the ridership has returned and trains have become more crowded, we have seen an increase in grand larceny this year, a 51% increase so far. So while that type of crime has trended down in the last four weeks, it's important to note that one quarter of these grand larcenies are fueled by the increase in pickpocket crime. Items such as wallets, phones, being removed from your jackets, from your bags. Pickpockets are not new to transit. They are an old nemesis to the transit system and they will now be drawn to the large crowds out shopping during the holiday season. So we do ask our riders to be vigilant when on the trains. Secure your items and always be aware of what's going on around you and who may be standing close to you or bumping into you. To combat this pickpocket issue, we have brought back something that I had in my prior time in transit that had, was no longer around, a dedicated pickpocket team. So we have now created a citywide 
transit pickpocket team who are out on the trains and have already made arrests. It's a dedicated, hand-picked, skilled group of supervisors, detectives, and officers that will be tracking any pickpocket crime activity in the subways and then attacking it. And they will also be on the lookout for known pickpocket recidivists, and we do know who they are. Um, so, again, winter is upon us, and we know that the call of winter brings added challenges uh, in dealing with the homeless. There's no doubt about that. That's historical. I have spoken many times here on a number of initiatives that we have done this year to officer services, to officer shelter, to the homeless, such as our end of the line operations. And these collaborative initiatives will continue. Since October 17th of this year, we have also been actively engaged in nightly operations in a joint partnership with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and our Subway Safety Task Force officers. These co-response teams visit eight targeted stations nightly to engage the homeless, offer them services, see if they need medical care, or if they are in mental crisis. In a little over one month, these co-response teams have made over 2,400 contacts with the homeless, taken nearly 370 persons to shelter, and removed an additional 30 to the hospital. In December, also, we will now deploy our transit district neighborhood coordination officers, the NCOs, out in the late night and evening hours, pairing them up also with our subway safety task force officers to go back into their neighborhood stations and actively seek out chronic and persistent homeless conditions. These teams will work hard to engage these homeless and hopefully take them out of the winter cold and get them into that place of safe shelter and safety they need. The main goal of this operation, which we're calling Home for the Holidays, is to provide the homeless in the subways with a real avenue towards long-term housing. So just in the spirit of Thanksgiving, I do feel compelled. I want to mention that I am thankful for the partnership between the MTA and the NYPD that we have built on, fostered, and maintained all of this year. Um, thank you, President Davey, thank you, Craig, everybody. I had a, um, Chair Jano, I look forward to our continued import, important work together in the coming months. So on a positive note and in closing, I just want to mention last week I, I rode the train a lot, the balloon inflation night during the parade, and I saw fantastic, happy, and exuberant crowds on those trains that I was riding. Positive things are happening. Uh, we will continue to work hard to keep everyone safe this holiday season. So just, I want to wish everyone safe and happy holidays, and I do hope to see you on one of those MTA holiday trains. Thank you. Thank you, Chief, and thank you for your partnership, because I always believe that when you work together, you get things done. Um, any questions for the Chief? Lisa. Had to write them down so I don't forget. Right. First of all, Chief, I want to say a huge thank you for those of us who ride the subways and for all the work that you and the men and women of Blue do. Totally respected um, and completely appreciated. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so I have a three-parter. One is when you began the stats, um, I keep hearing this year versus last year. Yeah. Why aren't the numbers more compared to 2019 pre-pandemic versus last year? Because the numbers would be completely off, right. um, making it seem, and probably that's not the right word, that crime is like really, really high versus um, if the numbers are more evened out for 2019. Right, so I look at it both ways. I, I definitely compare it to what, where we are now to where we are last year. That's CompStat, we have to do that. We have to balance that out and see where we are. But we know, and we are in a unique situation in transit where the ridership was completely uh, and, and depleted over the last, particularly in 2020 and then last year. And we're seeing this year, thank goodness, a major push back towards ridership coming back into the system. The trains are crowded again. People are, the platforms are crowded again. So while we do compare this year to last year, I do, and I mentioned it earlier, I do compare where we are this year to where we are were three years ago, four years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago. And I mentioned some of the numbers. The one that really jumps out is 10 years ago. We're down 15% this year compared to where we were 10 years ago. But we're also down 6% from where we were only three years ago. 
So I do look at that constantly, it's sort of a gauge. So, you know, we are in the comps that world this year versus last year, and it, it does ground me and gives me a sense of where we are. But I do look at the context, the historical context, and I think it's important, and you mentioned it, for, for people uh, to understand that when you see where we are now, 6.3 crimes a day, when you look at historical daily averages, um, we are very strong compared to where we were just several years ago. I happen to agree on that one, um, and it just tells a, a much more similar story. Um, as far as the arrest, right. um, because we have this consistent perception reality um, about repeat offenders, yeah. right? Um, the officers are arresting, they go through the court systems or not, and they are re-released. Do we have numbers to give us an idea as to the men and women doing all this work and having um, these same individuals uh, committing or recommitting the same type of offenses? So I, I mentioned pickpockets. Pickpockets, by their nature, are recidivists. We've dealt with them. Uh, some of the pickpockets that I've seen in the system this year were the same guys I dealt with 10 years ago. It's, 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 they, they're still here with us. But we've seen some new ones also. So when we do engage pickpockets, when we do arrest them, um, we do work closely with our DA's office to make sure that they are prosecuted uh, for that felony and hopefully receive jail time for it. So we do, you know, um, bring that to their attention and, and they are willing to work with us, but there are certain guidelines and, and ground rules that they are now uh, locked into, bail reform and things like that right. where, you know, or non-bail offenses where people are gonna get out. And, and we know that and we have to deal with that. And, you know, we'll keep making the arrests but we do work with the DA's office, you know, and we are dedicated to providing them what they need because that's an important part of the partnership with the DA. Yeah. You know, we make the arrest, but we have to give them what they need so they can prosecute the crime. So we're very focused on that as well. But we do, you know, I do expect the DA's office to, you know, to, uh, to follow through and prosecute to the fullest extent. Agreed. I think um, the partnerships are important, but is there a tracking mechanism about the repeat, because the numbers are really fantastic about the arrest. Yep. I'm just curious to know if if that number exists about who the repeat offenders, right? Because you have people do petty theft in the pharmacies, for instance, right? And we can go back and track that yep. some of these individuals have been arrested 30 times. Yep. I'm just curious if we have those type of numbers in our transit. So. You know, I know Sorry, you, uh, the Crime Control time. Strategies Office, Chief LePetri's office, they do track that mm -hmm. in terms of, uh, from a citywide perspective. And, you know, particularly with property crime, larceny and burglary, they're seeing a lot of repeat offenders. Okay. So that revolving door. Uh, in transit, a lot of our arrests are probably going to be non-bail arrests. You know, we make a lot of misdemeanor arrests, uh, and that's just a, a fact. Um, but, again, it doesn't mean we're not, we don't know who they are and we don't focus on them. We, one particular pickpocket, very well known, we actually followed him from court. When he got out, we had locked him, we had arrested him for grand larceny, he was charged with grand larceny, he gets out of Manhattan criminal court. But we, we, our intent was to follow him into the transit system. He didn't even get there. He did a pickpocket of a 70-year-old woman on the street in Chinatown and we arrested him right there. So. We arrested him again. Yes, he got back out again, but again, we're not wavering on this commitment to it. You know, eventually it will catch up to them, these felony crimes, because uh, grand larceny is a felony. And we need the DAs, and you know, and I know we have the MTA support on that to make sure that those uh, felonies are prosecuted as a felony. And my last part, if you don't mind, Chair, um, regarding the homeless, yeah. I know that there's, um, I don't know if it's law or regulation where the organization providing services can't mandate or remove the homeless. Does that apply for in the subway station in the subways? So, I mean, listen, I think one of the game changes of this year has really been the uh, the collaborative effort that we put forth in the subway safety plan 
and it's it's an NYPD effort. I know the MTA police are very involved in this. You know, I want to I want to throw a shout out to them. You know, we're working with uh, Commissioner Jenkins from DHS Homeless Services, Health and Mental Hygiene. Uh, you know, it's really a collaborative effort, and it's it's a difficult one. And you know, and they you know, they can't be legally forced into shelter. Right, that's what I thought. Um, but that doesn't mean we don't work hard to get them to shelter. We've taken thousands of them out of the subways this year between those initiatives I mentioned and our subway safety task force, probably over 10, 11,000 to shelter. Do they stay there? Not all of them. We know that. But it doesn't mean we're not going to keep, stop, uh, keep trying to get them eventually where they stay and then they become, you know, eventually get a home. I mean, that's the goal. So winter time is tough. We are in the crunch time for the homelessness. Uh, Cold weather brings them in, and it's just we have to redouble our effort at this time of year for that. So then I'll start, I'll end like I started. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts for all that you do and the partnerships within the Transit, yourselves, and the MTA. Thank you. So thank you, and happy holidays. Happy holidays. Any other questions to the chief? If not, thank you, chief. Thank you. Uh, we're now going to move on to uh, Lou Montani for this month's uh, uh, Procurements, excuse me. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, the New York City Transit Procurement Package includes five actions in the amount of $304.4 million. The first is an award of two modifications to exercise options for the purchase of 289 low floor 40 foot diesel buses for MTA Bus com Company in the combined estimated amount of $230.7 million. Uh, Nova Bus, uh, one of the companies, will provide 173 buses in the estimated amount of $137.35 million. New Flyer of America, the second company, will provide 116 diesel buses in the estimated amount of $93.35 million. These new buses will replace buses that are beyond their 12-year service life. The combined delivery is scheduled to begin in September 2023 and be completed by June 2024. Pricing for these option buses is based on uh, pr the price per bus competitively obtained in the base contracts to which an adjustment formula also established in the base, reflecting changes in labor and material costs, uh, currency exchange rates, and other agreed upon factors as applied. With respect to New York State content, the award to NOVA will result in 35% New York State content and for New Flyer, 21.2% totaling $67.8 million in New York, con New York State content overall. These buses will be outfitted with all of the latest features, including pre-wiring for Omni, as well as automated bus lane enforcement. The next item is an award to JBA Change Management Corporation for consulting services for the New York City Transit Department of Subway's maintenance of way that will build upon previous work under the Subway Action Plan in the amount of $31.4 million. JBA will focus on longer term uh, preventive work and maintenance strategies aimed to increase the overall subway system's reliability with a focus on the maintenance of track, signal, power, and infrastructure assets to preemptively prevent system failures. The contract includes incentive payments for reliability improvements and savings. The remaining items are a modification to the multi-agency contract with Cubic Transportation Systems for New, pay, new Fair Payment System, Omni, to implement software and hardware enhancements that will provide operation and public, operational and public-facing improvements to 2,375 configurable vending machines, CVMs, in the amount of $27.5 million. The CVM will replace the existing Metro card uh, and ticketing vending machines currently in use and become the primary distribution method for customers to purchase Omni cards. And the final item is a ratification of an immediate operating need and approval of the award made to transit sourcing services for the purchase of 10,000 subway car wheels, uh, one of the most critical components in the maintenance of New York City Transit subway car fleet in the amount of $14.8 million. I submit these procurements for board approval. David Jones has a question. David. Yeah, in terms of the purchase of uh, these new, new buses, how does this fit into the zero admission uh, target we're, we're doing? Obviously, it's a fairly substantial 
uh, allocation. The, these were always part of the capital plan. This is not a deviation from what we set out. And Frank, w could you elaborate a bit on how this fits in in getting us to 2040 and the, and the yeah? Uh, so zero these are emissions? these are these are included in the current approved capital plan. The the uh, zero emission um, target, which we're going to we're going to make, is 2040. So it requires any fleet purchase after 2028 to be 100 percent zero emission because we have a 12 year life cycle on our buses. So therefore, um, you know, and and we have. We've set an aggressive target. We're accelerating, so it will include these purchases. Do include some diesels, but we also ha have uh, CNG and hybrid buses built in, and these are all part of the plan. But not in this particular procurement. Not in this procurement, but next but month next, you're going to see. Okay. Yep, for sure. And then keep in mind we have the 60 that already in process of these zero emission electrics. Majori. And correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding was that um, you're still testing a lot of the EV vehicles that you've bought, and so that all of those operational issues, design issues, all of that needs to be vetted before you can start just purchasing full EV fleet. So this is this diesel is just like a pure replacement of assets that are out of that's no longer in use. I just want to make sure I understand that. Okay. Any other questions for Lou? If not, um, I'd like to hear a, oh, sorry, go ahead, a, di sorry. a different procurement. I have a question. Go. So, so Omni, 27, oh wait, actually on the bus one, I thought there was a funding shortfall, so I just wanted to understand what that meant. It said $36 million funding shortfall in the fun I staff don't know, summary. I don't know specifically about the $37 million. They're, they're, they, they utilize some money from the capital program for okay. other buses to cover this procurement because of the desperate need requirement. Okay, so, so maybe I can just understand that. background on that because it just said it in the back, like there's a little funding shortfall and I just wanted to understand it. On the Omni, uh, that's a $27 million increase to the contract. Kind of what happened there? Um, because I think we always knew Omni was going to be, and maybe this is better for the Omni lead and happy to ask that question, but always knew that it was going to be a Long Island Railroad, Metro North, Subway, bus effort, all of the services right. at MTA. So I guess I'm a little confused about why now we need to do a scope change on the and the CBMs, um, because 27 is substantive on like a $500 million contract. Okay, I, I think contract. if I could just generally say, and, sure. and possibly there's someone here that can elaborate, uh, these were, were I identified through the process as enhancements either from an operational standpoint, from the standpoint of those that are maintaining and operating the equipment, as well as some public-facing uh, uh, enhancements in terms of visibility and displays and, and quality of information. So I don't think these were shortfalls or deficiencies as much as along the way these were identified as, as benefits, uh, both, again, from an operational and from a, uh, a rider standpoint. Any other questions for Lou on the procurements? Okay, if not, I'd like to hear a motion to approve the procurements. Lisa, second. Midori, all those in favor? Opposed? Ayes have it. Procurement carries. Okay, now I'd like to have a motion to adjourn the meeting. David, second. Lisa, all those in favor? Meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone.